<clears throat> Steph, let's hope that um, um, someone has a case, but if not, um, uh, are there any interesting patients on your service? Yeah, there are. And we could even, uh, um, just because I have to leave at 1140, we could even just make it fit in that time. But yes, I'm, I'm very happy to share a cold case with you guys. A hot cold case, as it were. Mm. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining um, Wednesday VMR from uh, all over the world. I'm very happy to be here with, with you all, as always. Um, um, things in Houston, Texas are okay. Uh, COVID is starting to really ramp up again, as I'm sure it, it is a lot of places. So I hope everybody is um, staying healthy and doing okay with, um, with that. And as always, we'd uh, love to have um, somebody share a case and two people to discuss it with us. And in the meantime, I will actually ask uh, Kirtan, who's here today and was uh, presented the case yesterday uh, to just um, share a, a, a mini five minute kind of recap um, uh, of, the, of the case presentation and the big learning points that, that he shared with everyone. Yes, sure. Good morning. Thanks, Dan, for the opportunity. And so actually it was a case of a gentleman who presented with atrophy and motor weakness in all the limbs. So basically it progressed from involving only right extremity to all the extremity. And there were classic signs of UMN as well as the element. So there was evidence of brisk reflexes in lower extremities. There was atrophy in the upper extremities, in the interosseous muscles, in the biceps, in the triceps, and everything progressed over a course of two years. And so it was, you know, classic script for ALS because there is nothing on the no conduction studies. There is no evidence of motor neuropathy. So all kind of paraproteinemias or motor neuropathy mimicking ALS was out of the question. So it was classic script for ALS. But the only problem is that whenever we give someone a diagnosis of ALS, we have to ensure that we have excluded all other possibilities because it's a dead statement. There are no other treatments. And even if there are treatments, they can prolong the life only for a few months and not more than two to three years at the most. So that's why I titled the case as an elementary diagnosis because what are some of the mimics of ALS? So first of all, we have to rule out that if there is something wrong with the spinal cord itself or not. So we have to check for vitamin B12 levels, vitamin E, copper, all the classic causes of myelopathy. We have to think about viruses like HIV, CMV, West Nile virus, all those viruses which have pre-election to involve the anterior horn cells. In fact, a few weeks back, there was a case of HTLV1 myelopathy presented by our team member Valeria. So we have to rule out all these viruses. And in the CNS, we have to rule out parasagittal and foramen magnum meningiomas because meningiomas in those critical locations can hit all the limbs at the same time. Because if you see the homunculus, then in those regions, both the arms as well as legs are represented. So foramen magnum meningioma and parasagittal meningioma, we have to rule out. And we have to rule out spinal cord malformations like syringomyelia or Arnold Kiley malformation before we tag someone as having ALS. And finally, cervical spondylosis. So usually we see the cervical spondylosis in people who are above 70 years of age, but occasionally it can even occur in you know, middle age, so between 40 to 70 years of age. And as it was the case in our patient that when we did the MRI, there was evidence of osteophytes, which were causing ventral indentation of the spinal cord extending from the C5 to C8 and even the lumbosacral region. And since they were indenting only on the ventral aspect, you were not able to see the evidence of other sensory symptoms. For example, loss of pain and temperature or any you know, tingling sensations that you classically hope to see when spinal cord is involved. Even there was no involvement of bowel or bladder because only the entire horn cells were involved. So that is known as DML, that is dissociated motor loss. So it's kind of variant of cervical spondylosis. And lastly, I also mentioned the possibility that in Asians and in young Asians, we get something known as Hirayama disease. So it is a recently discovered entity wherein when you flex your neck, there is predilection for the compression of anterior horn cells. So in order to detect the Hirayama disease causing ALS-like symptoms, you have to order a special form of MRI, which is known as flexion T2 weight MRI. So if you suspect it, then you should order that MRI and you will find the classic signs of dural thickening and dural compression that will seal the diagnosis of Hiriyama disease. 
and all you need is to give patient a cervical collar and that will resolve all the symptoms. So it's a must not miss diagnosis, cervical spondylosis and hiriyama disease. But since our patient was older than the younger age group, so hiriyama was less likely. And final diagnosis of cervical spondylosis, even the classic signs on MRI findings. So that was the take home message that don't give diagnosis of ALS unless and until you have excluded each and every other possibility so that patient can survive and we can do interventions. Amazing, Kirtan. Um, I love learning from you. And uh, thank you for that recap. And um, um, yeah, just a really, really important, interesting case and important um, the teaching points. I also, when I was looking at the summary board and the patient had positive Hoffman sign, and um, that's something that um, I, I just quickly uh, reviewed and, and thought I'd share with everyone else too, where um, it's essentially a sign of um, um, cervical uh, myelopathy. And the way that you elicit it is you, is you grab the, the middle finger with your thumb here um, and quickly kind of flick it like this. And um, you shouldn't have any sort of um, response uh, to that maneuver in, in normal circumstances. And a positive test is when upon the flick, you see a slight flexion of the index finger and abduction of the thumb. So it kind of, I don't know if I'll be able to mimic it perfectly, but it kind of looks like this. Okay, and it can be very subtle. Is that anything to correct or add from that, Kirtan? Okay. And that's the mechanism of that is it's a hyperreflexia? It, yeah, it's essentially a, a, a sort of a reflex, an abnormal reflex like Babinski's, but, but it tends to localize to the, to the cervical cord rather than elsewhere. Um, awesome. Where are we, Steph? Uh, we are at CPS VMR <laughs> Wednesday. Um, well, good to be here. I, uh, I actually have a current case on uh, my team um, that I would love your guys' help with. So I'm happy to sh take us through that, um, but still need uh, one or two people to help Zavin help me. Help me help her. Help me help her. That's a, it's a Jerry Maguire reference. Mm -hmm. um, great movie, if, if everyone here hasn't, hasn't seen it, um, which I wouldn't be surprised. It's I guess, probably, what, 20 years old now. Yeah, that's getting to be a movie that when you reference it, we, we start to sound a bit dated <laughs> in our pop culture. Um, so who wants, to, uh, who wants to buddy up with me? Um, Help, uh, help me out. I'll, I'll need it. Um, slash. It'll the lion. Just... Are we going to get in the lion, uh, Franco, uh, buddy up again? Nope. No pressure, by the way, if, Franco, if you're not available. Um, but yeah, the lion, that would be awesome. Oh, and Franco can too. <laughs> All right. Um, that, that sounds good. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Nilay and Franco. Excited to discuss with you again. Um, take it away, Steph. All right. Um, uh, is Andrea or uh, Kirtan scribing, just so I know? Uh, Kirtan scribing, yep. Okay. Uh, and just so the group knows, um, I actually have to sign off by 1140-ish, so um, I can time us so that we get everything we need to discuss by then. Um, so just, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of go through it quickly, but I, I think um, it'll work really well. So the chief concern is left upper quadrant pain. And the story is that of a 62 year old man uh, who has really no um, medical history other than uh, 12 years ago, a gunshot wound. Um, for which he got an exploratory lapar laparotomy and repair of his ureter, ureter on the right, but no other injuries. Coming in with one month of left upper quadrant pain that's been slowly progressive, um, not associated with any um, pain elsewhere, uh, diarrhea, um, nausea or vomiting, but associated with a decrease in appetite, um, some early satiety, 
and a weight loss of about seven kilograms. Uh, and let me stop there and turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Steph. Um, Nilayan, why don't you uh, get us started? How do you think about uh, left upper quadrant pain um, in general? And then maybe Franco uh, layer on some of the additional symptoms in history. <clears throat> so we have a 62 year old male presenting with a one month complaint of left upper quadrant pain, right? So when I think of left upper quadrant pain, I would like to delineate it, uh, delineate it anatomically. So in the left upper quadrant, we have stomach, we have spleen, we have pancreas, we have um, diaphragm, we have lungs, we have pleura, and then we also have the um, splint flexure of the uh, colon, and then we have the intestines. And uh, a pathology with any of these can present with a left upper quadrant pain. Also, it can be a referred pain. So a pathology elsewhere can get referred to left upper quadrant, right? And um, so how do we decide which one of these organs are involved? I think um, we can... Um, make uh, make use of the other symptoms associated symptoms we have but uh, just to make um, an observation on the age and the uh, duration of the disease so this is a 62 year old male with a one month complaint so the complaint is chronic so um i'm i will consider something like a cancer or something like a chronic inflammation something like an ibd or maybe a chronic a subacute endocarditis to be um, higher up uh, higher up the, uh, the list uh, than something more acute more uh, uh, more uh, something like a bacterial infection, something like a staph or, staph or strep, that would be something uh, lower on my list. And a one month history uh, makes it um, sort of a uh, subacute or indolent uh, sort of process. So um, it it can any uh, it can um, it doesn't give me a clue as to which organ is involved because a one month history can include stomach. So something like a, ga a gas a uh, gastric outlet obstruction can present this way or um, something like um, splenic impact. However, splenic impact, I'm assuming, won't pain for one month. It, it, it won't ache for one month, uh, maybe for a few days and it will end. Um, but um, it can easily be IBD, uh, IBD involving the splenic texture area, something like that. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. So I think I am, I am next. Well, as Nilayan said, <clears throat> I think I could also focus on the symptoms of early society and decreased appetite, so, and the weight loss. Immediately after thinking that, uh, I will think that the weight loss is because of his stopping eating because he's with early society, or if there is something that, that like he's hypermetabolic, you know, like TNF alpha is the main driver for cachexia, the onco oncogenic processes that uh, could also play a role here. Uh, if the patient would present with vomiting later on, not, not right now, we could also be thinking about some neoplastic process in the upper GI depending on if the vomiting is just after he eats some sort of like a pyloric stenosis uh, feature, but because of a mass, because of a cancer in the stomach that could also have referred pain to the left upper quadrant. Talking also about the spleen, if there is a increase of size, if there is a splenomegaly and the spleen is hard, we could also be thinking about some uh, leukemia features. So for uh, uh, yeah, from some sort of cancer that has the splenomegaly over there. Uh, I would also think uh, besides this, well, he had a gunshot, right? So he had a, a surgery exploration there. Even if there's a retro reconstruction, we can also be thinking about additions, additions that have happened because of the surgery. I will also be thinking about um, if there is fever, look for an splenic abscess. Sometimes uh, these patients can have um, abscess due to embolic uh, septic, uh, due to a heart problem that could have could be in the setting of that. Uh, I think that complements what the lion said. <clears throat> complements so beautifully that I really don't have um, anything else to add. Um, thank you guys. That was great, um, Steph. What um what else you got for us? 
Okay, let me give you more. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, accelerate us through the other relevant past history, the exam, and then I'm actually gonna give you guys the CBC also, um, just to kind of achieve some specific objectives with the case. Uh, he's on no medications. Um, he's got no family history of um, uh, malignancy that he knows of, solid or liquid. <clears throat> um, social history, nothing relevant. He, he lives with his family here in Houston, Texas, um, and health-related behaviors, just notable for 15 cigarettes per day um, for several decades, has no allergies. His vitals here, um, temperature was a, a 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 37.8 degrees Celsius, heart rate 90s, Blood pressure 120 over 60, a 98% on room air. Um, he weighs uh, 70 kilograms. Um, and I didn't calculate his BMI, but he do, he does not look he looks he does not look uh, wasted at all. That's appropriate for his height. It seems his weight. Um, uh, Generally, he looks well. He um, is actually making jokes with us when we see him, um, you know, says his pain is better after some pain medication, so, and is in pretty good spirits. Um, uh, and the, I'll comment on abdominal exam and um, lymph node exam, everything else being normal. On the abdominal exam, um, he, he's nervous about us even going near him to palpate him. So he's sort of just anticipating it'll be painful. Um, but um, in all quadrants, except the left upper quadrant, he can tolerate leap, uh, deep and light palpation. The left upper quadrant is uh, really pretty tender, even with light palpation. And uh, to be honest, we didn't really dig super far because it really hurt him a lot. Um, although I, I wouldn't say he had any, um, uh, kind of involuntary guarding or rebound at all. And um, we could palpate the uh, liver tip, I would say, or not the tip, but the edge of the liver was probably about two centimeters below the costal margin. And we could palpate, palpate the spleen uh, fairly far down. I'd say at the level of the umbilicus, you could feel the spleen. Um, he had no palpable lymph nodes in the cervical or supraclavicular area, axilla or groin. And um, that is the exam. And then by the time we saw him, we knew the CBC, which I, I wanna give you up front to put us in our mindset with him. And that was, a uh, white blood cell count of uh, 250,000, um, with a uh, differential diagnosis that had, let me just pull it up here, um, a lot of kind of early myeloid forms. Uh, I, I can't find the exact numbers, but um, there were a good number of neutrophils and then a significant number of myelocytes, promyelocytes and peripherally um, uh, four percent blasts. Four percent what stuff? Uh, blasts. Oh, okay. And um, his hemoglobin was uh, 11 with an MCV of 94. And his platelets were 2,400,000. Um, and maybe just I'll, I'll mention that the, his chem panel, his chem 7 was completely normal. Um, his uric acid was 5. His FOS was normal at 3. and his liver biochemical panel was normal. So the rest, <laughs> rest of chemistry is all normal. Okay. And let me stop there. Thanks, Steph.
Um, <clears throat> Franco, why don't you um, go first this time? How, um, how do these findings uh, narrow your differential? Oh, I think so pretty much the finding of an enlarged spleen, I would like to ask if it is a hard spleen or it is kind of soft spleen. Because I think sometimes when the spleen is hard, it guys before seeing any labs, it guys to CLL, but after seeing labs, we know that there are precursors. But it, I think it's important to know that. Uh, with with that uh, cell count and myeloid precursors and blood and the presence of blast, we could also be looking for AML, some sort of uh, yeah, mainly AML. The platelet counts also can sometimes can be due to there is an increase because usually when there is one blood cell line that is increased, the other is on the expense of the others. So usually we see, I don't know, we see a lot of uh, white cells with reduction of the other cells. Now we have two cells that are driving this process. So I think that kind points uh, takes out of the out of the of the of the picture for me. But I will definitely still be looking for a AML, um, uh, maybe a hairy cell, or but hairy cell neoplasm. It's also because of all cells. So I mainly be this is for me this point to a leukemia process, mainly a AML, yeah, or CCL probably. But the blast kind of uh, get off my picture. Awesome, good stuff, Franco. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Nilayan, if you um, if you had to guess just based on the differential, let's dig a little deeper into the possibilities of specific hematologic kind of um, neoplasms. Um, what do you think is more mo most likely based on this kind of CBC differential? Uh, yeah. So uh, my first thoughts as the case was being narrated was sixty-two year old male with WBC that high. So the first thought that crossed my mind was MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome. And then I saw that the platelets were 2 million. And then the platelets of 2 million uh, really brought me to my low proliferative syndromes, something like essential thrombocytosis or uh, maybe CML, uh, because uh, as Franco mentioned that the spleen is hard, uh, the spleen is tender, and it's so massive. This is a massive splenomegaly, right? We know that the spleen enlarges from the left upper quadrant to the right lower quadrant, that is uh, the lactosa. And this is almost near the level of umbilicus. So this is a massive splenomegaly. And as Franco mentioned, it's very important that uh, to differentiate a hard versus a soft splenomegaly. And um, yeah, those. Uh, apart from that, uh, I really thought of CNL, which is chronic neutrophilic, uh, I believe, leukemia. Leukemia, or I think lymphoma. I'm not. I'm. I'm confusing between the two. CNL. So yeah, uh, looking at uh, the fact that there are only four percent blasts and um, mostly neutrophils. It could have been CNL, but the fact that platelets are so high uh, literally rules that out. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking at some sort of myeloproliferative disorder um, and maybe, uh, well, bone marrow, bone marrow biopsy here is essential because if we say that the blasts are more than 20%, then we are looking at AML or uh, maybe CML in blast crisis. Um, whatever it may be, I think hydroxyurea here is uh, warranted because the patient may land in, um, I think, hyperviscosity syndrome it is. That's Beautiful. Okay. So um, great discussion about sort of the, the differential. And then I love that last point that you kind of uh, folded in and um, uh, that Steph also alluded to with some of the relevant labs she provided, which is kind of some of the complications and thus the, the management. Um, so let me talk about those two things, just kind of maybe offer a framework of how I think about, um, you know, hyperleukocytosis and different leukemias. Um, as well as some of the complications that as internists, as generalists, you know, any doctor um, should be aware of um, to, to, to manage and stabilize these patients, um, you know, while we're collaborating with, with our hematology colleagues. So um, the term hyperleukocytosis refers to a white blood cell count over usually 100,000, um, depending on, on definitions, uh, over 50,000. And most of the time, um, white cell counts that high are, are not reactive, okay? They're from a primary um, hematologic sort of uh, abnormal kind of ne neoplasm. 
Um, and, and those are usually, uh, you know, leukemias when it comes to um, hyperleukocytosis, the white cell being so high. Some of the other myeloproliferative disorders like, you know, polycythemia, essential thrombocytosis, um, you know, you have, you can have high hemoglobins, high platelets, and the white cell count there can be a little bit high, but when you have a white cell count over 100,000, that's usually, you know, more in a category of some kind of a leukemia, all right? Okay, how do you think about leukemias? Um, uh, there's two sort of branch points. Um, think acute versus chronic, okay? And then myeloid versus lymphoid, okay? So you have acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the lymphoid sort of version, and both of those are characterized by, by blasts, right? Like that's, that's the telltale. Now you may see a lot of blasts in the periphery, but oftentimes the, the, the blast percentage that leads to the definitive diagnosis is actually on a bone marrow biopsy. And then there's your chronic side. I'm gonna elicit a Hoffman sign in myself here if I do this long enough. Then there's a chronic side, and there again, you have chronic myelogenous leukemia, myeloid, Okay, and chronic lymphocytic lymph leukemia, um, and th that's you know sort of so the chronic ones are you know not blasts; um, they are more kind of slightly more differentiated versions, and thus have a more subacute or chronic onset. Sometimes can be entirely asymptomatic. So in this case, the fact that there's not you know there's two hundred fifty thousand cells, and uh, there's only four percent blasts. Um, uh, this is initially kind of more suggestive as, you know, of, a, of a chronic myeloid leukemia based on this differential of you know, uh, mostly myeloid precursor cells, you know, uh, bands, um, um, uh, gosh, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, et cetera. Okay? And there are some, some blasts as well. So this really seems like CML, and it's also compatible with you know, the syndrome of presenting with massive splenomegaly. I'll never forget as an intern, I had a patient who was admitted to be um, uh, with, with CML. And he, he just told us like very calm, like he described, you know, early satiety so vividly of, of just, you know, um, takes a few bites and suddenly he just feels like he ate a whole pizza, right? And he had this massive spleen and a CBC that looked very much like this. Um, so, um, so it's not an uncommon presentation of, uh, of CML, of just a mass effect of the splenomegaly causing early satiety with or without, you know, weight loss and stuff like that. Okay, now what do we make of these 4% blasts? Um, I actually am not sure whether just the presence of that many blasts in the periphery is already enough to, to, to diagnose or very strongly suspect um, a, a transformation of CML into a more acute accelerating uh, um, blast form, basically like CML transforming into AML, which can happen, uh, or if this amount of blasts is sort of like could still be just part of the CML and isn't necessarily kind of doesn't change the diagnosis and isn't necessarily treated differently. And that, uh, that, if that is where, you know, uh, hematology comes in. That's where a bone marrow biopsy comes in. That's where, you know, peripheral flow cytometry and cytogenetics come in, um, et cetera. Okay. How do we manage this patient to make sure that while we're figuring out the hematologic diagnosis, they don't get super sick um, and sustain, uh, you know, organ damage or worse? So, um, uh, Nilayan, you were referring to hyperviscosity, right? And anytime you have hyperleukocytosis, you should at least think and worry about the possibility of hyperviscosity. Hyperviscosity um, is basically when the cells, either because of just the viscosity of the cells based on the leukocrit, like if you spin down this, this, this guy's blood, you know, here's the tube, there will be the hematocrit, right? Oh my God, this is perfect. This pen is perfect. See, the black is the hematocrit, okay? And then right above it, see, that's the leukocrit, all right? And if this is 100%, the hematocrit is 45 right now, 250 CML cells, this will probably be the leukocrit, okay? Maybe a little bit less. But the point is that you can have enough of these cells that it actually makes your blood thicker and it makes it really hard to flow through the, you know, through the microcirculation. Now, it's worst when you have blasts. If this was 250,000 blasts, this patient would be way sicker, okay? Because they would, their blood would just be like thick white gel, all right? Because the blasts are bigger and they're stickier. So what are symptoms of hyperviscosity? 
shortness of breath, neurologic um, dysfunction, cardiopulmonary dysfunction. Um, you can have a lot of clots form, um, uh, but most, and you know, it's sort of like, think of, think of sickle cell, sickle cell crisis, it's sort of like the same symptoms, uh, but predominantly CNS and, and, and um, uh, chest orienting. And that's where it's really important to leuco reduce hydroxyurea, you know, IV fluids. You don't want to try to transfuse these people. Uh, you want to try to get the white cell count uh, quickly. And okay, the other complication is what Steph alluded to, which is spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome, right? So the FOS and the uric acid being normal and the potassium makes us take a deep breath and recognize that we don't need to manage that complication. I think for the purpose of time, um, uh, let's pause there and see what Steph uh, has for us and, and what else she wants us to talk about in this case. Awesome discussion. You guys are exactly where we are. Um... And I will, I'll give you one more aliquot, which is um, a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. And then kind of, yeah, I'll let you know sort of what's happening in the meantime, but this is where the story ends right now. Um, CT abdomen and pelvis um, showed uh, kind of three pertinent things that I'll tell you about. Uh, one is um, hepato and splenomegaly. The liver is about 19 centimeters. Um, in its longest length, the spleen is 17 centimeters, and the spleen is clearly pushing against the stomach. The two other findings um, were a bit of a surprise and where I need your help. Um, the second finding is um, subcapsular on the spleen, there is a, um, a fluid collection that's about six by four by eight centimeters. Subcapsular splenic fluid collection. The third finding um, is uh, two other um, organized fluid collections, um, sort of between the peritoneum and the abdominal wall, um, both sort of towards the left upper quadrant, but not at, not at all touching the spleen. Like it very much looks like it's at sort of the interface of the peritoneal cavity and the kind of abdominal wall. And those are about kind of three by four by two in size of centimeters. So um, this is sort of where we are. And what I'm really excited to hear about your thoughts for real life discussion is what are these collections? What do we do about them? Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'll tell you, um, he is on hydroxyurea for cytoreduction. Um, he's getting a bone marrow biopsy today to further inform the um, leukemia thought. The working diagnosis is CML, perhaps with accelerated or blast phase. Um, but these imaging findings were a surprise beyond the fact the spleen and the liver are big. So would love to hear what you guys think. Nilayan, what do you think these uh, these collections are? Any guesses? Um, I'm not at all sure with the collections. Can I go on with the hepatomegaly part? I think I may be able to explain that better. Um, so uh, hepatomegaly part, I thought that uh, maybe these, uh, these cells, right? They are entering into the liver, they are entering into the sinusoids and they are getting stuck there, right? So they're not able to exit. So maybe that can explain the hepatomegaly. Maybe, maybe the, uh, these are the seedings of the various um, uh, cancerous cells in the liver. Uh, I'm not, not too sure. And the subcapsular splenic collection, uh, splenic fluid collection, I'm hearing this for the first time. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we see this uh, basically whenever there is a very malignant tumor, we see that the center of the tumor becomes necrotic and it can be confused with the fluid-like appearance on MRI or CT. Maybe this is something like that happening in the spleen. Not at all sure, just a conjecture. Um, the sp uh, spleen fluid collection, I have no idea, absolutely never seen it, never read about it. So I cannot comment about that. And organized fluid collection between the abdomen and the peritoneal wall um, sounds like some sort of peritoneal collection, however loculated. So I think that this could be some sort of infection going on because a lymphoma patient uh, or leukemia patient is predisposed to infection, right? So there are so many the bone marrow is so infiltrated that the normal cells are not functioning. This is a, uh, there is a possibility that there's some sort of 
uh, peritonitis um, going on and the patient is too immunocompromised to have a, a reaction against it. So maybe the patient is not able to mount some uh, immunological reaction such as fever. And well, how will you see an infection if the counts are so high raised, right? I mean, how do you say the patient has infection in this case? If the patient is so far immunocompromised, uh, the WBCs are so high that you cannot appreciate a small uh, rise in WBCs that is indicative of infection. So maybe CRP or ESR, I'm not too sure, but uh, yeah. Thank you, Nalayan. Um, really great, great uh, hypotheses there. Uh, Franco, anything to add? Well, Nalayan said it perfectly, these patients are in, in fact immunosuppressed, but also this the size of the liver and the spleen can actually have rough tours. They are necrotic in the center, like he said, and there can be rough tours and this fluid could also be a septic one just because of the infarctions in the in the liver or in the spleen. And so the question is, is this uh, a sept septic, um, is an infection going on or this is sort of uh, inflammatory thing that is, the process is due to a physical enlargement of the spleen and the liver that have rupture and have uh, display a little a little of uh, liquid there. Uh, another thing I could think about it, um, reactivation of some of some uh, of some bacterial causes, tuberculosis, for for example. Although this patient is in the U.S., so probably it can be less. Um, mostly, I think they are going to end up studying that fluid. Um, great, great points, Franco. Yeah, I think I take very well um, the idea. Steph, we will, we'll, I'll keep it short. We'll wrap up in a minute. Um, I t I, very good point that, he, you know, he does not have an, a normal immune system and he's very predisposed to, you know, infections and opportunistic infections. But this would be kind of like a weird uh, way for an infection to present, right? Just to be this like, you know, fluid collection uh, separate from the spleen, but under the capsule, right? And then these like subperitoneous fluid collections. I mean, if he had also some intestinal pathology, you know, on the CT or somehow clinically, um, I don't know, it just like seems like a weird story from infection, but I think, I think very possible. Um, the other possibilities, you know, um, I think bleeding, bleeding is possible. And then I, um, uh, I think if I heard correctly, um, one of y'all was also suggesting a possible like a uh, rup rupture of the, uh, of the spleen. And I'm curious where these, uh, like a contained rupture, you know, but I'm curious where these um, other collections are relative to the spleen, if they're right nearby or not. Uh, and then the final possibility is that there is such a thing uh, as myeloid sarcoma. And that term basically um, uh, refers to a conglomeration of usually it's AML cells, blasts, and like basically AML presenting with like mass lesions as opposed to just, you know, a leukemic disease. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure if this can happen with, uh, with CML cells also presenting with mass lesions or fluid collections, um, but uh, it could happen if this is sort of in a, in a blast phase, accelerated phase, you could have collections of these uh, leukemic blasts basically uh, presenting as either mass-like lesions or fluid collections. Or um, So uh, either way, I think uh, the splenic one might be harder to sample, but uh, Steph, are, is that what you guys were thinking and was there a plan to try to get some of that? Yes, that, that was a consideration. I'll just say that the diagnosis for these matters understanding what treatment he's about to get, right? Because he's probably, particularly if this is accelerated or blast phase CML, he'll need very strong induction chemotherapy and will be at huge risk for infection. So if there's one there already, we want to know that. Again, in the context of a mild fever of 100, which of course could be from the leukemia itself when we think about our inflammatory differential. So, um, you know, the, the subcapsular collection, it really looks like it's within and part of the um, or that it came from the spleen, like it's very clearly inside the spleen. It's like the capsule gives a nice little cover to it. So I saw some discussion, or you guys discussed, and I saw in the chat thoughts about, could this huge spleen just have ruptured on its own, even without trauma? That I think makes some sense. And the fluid looks very um, much the sort of density of blood. So I, and, and we already talked to interventional radiology. They said, oof, that's not even that accessible. So I think we probably will 
likely presume this could be um, splenic rupture spontaneous, uh, perhaps in the context of, despite the fact having 2 million platelets, functional ability of the platelets isn't great. Um, so that's that. Now, what to do with the abdominal wall fluid collections though? You know, they, they are more in the left upper quadrant than anywhere else, but as I said, they're not at all contiguous with the spleen. There's, an, you know, intestines and stuff before those are there. So I don't know what to do about those. Um, whether to try and sample those, those would be very accessible with a needle. Uh, I think we probably will, at least to um, perhaps get cytology and a gram stain and culture, again, to make sure uh, it's not an infection there. It doesn't quite look like an abscess and it's radiographic features in terms of uh, being, you know, having a thick wall. Um, so I think that's where we're headed. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm thinking those are a distinct process from the fluid in the spleen. And again, sort of feels a bit high stakes because of the induction chemotherapy he's likely to get in the next day or so. Um, so don't have an answer right now. I think the thought of um, a myeloid sarcoma is, is a really great one. Um, you know, it does look more liquid than sort of tissue density on imaging, but um, I, I think we will end up sampling those kind of very um, uh, peripheral fluid collections just to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, that's where we are now. Any final um, kind of thoughts or insights uh, from you guys? I really appreciate the help thinking through this. Steph, I wanna um, I wanna uh, uh, respect your your other commitment and uh, let you go. Um, but uh, we, we we can keep talking the rest of us, um, and uh, I, I can I can communicate any additional ideas to you later. Please uh, do. Thanks, really guys. Um, see you later. Um, what, what what do y'all think, um, Franco? Um, and Nilayan, and actually, um, let me open up the chat and see what other ideas people have so I can make sure to relate everything to Steph later. Um, any other thoughts on the case? You know, if it, it was a great case, I would pretty much uh, re, uh, point the importance of the physical exam on these sort of patients. Uh, I am why why interested about knowing later on what the what these fluid collections uh, end to be? Mm, I think we yield everything. It's a great case. Undoubtedly, I mean, uh, such a uh, supposedly such a simple case of CML. I mean, it's something we study in second year, and uh, and that fluid collection part totally stunned me. I've never seen it. I've never heard about it. And something that I will definitely read on, uh, including that myeloid sarcoma uh, pearl. Amazing, amazing pearl. How uh, same cancer can present in uh, with two different radiological appearances. Something like very solid and something liquid. Uh, amazing connections. Thank you so much for the case. Learned a lot. Thanks for discussing, y'all. Um, cool. Uh, Andrea, do you want to summarize the teaching points? But before you, you get started, I just want to let everybody know, um, thank you again for joining. And I hope um, you can join again next week. And hopefully by then, Steph will have some follow-up on the case. And I also want to ask everyone um, in, the, in the meeting right now who doesn't identify as a man, um, please uh, think about uh, sort of uh, amping yourself up to to volunteer and discuss next Wednesday with us. Um, we would love to have um, uh, a broad sort of representation of um, uh, uh, folks as discussants. Um, so we hope uh, you, you'll um, take the lead next time. Um, Andrea, will you uh, will you take us home with some teaching points, please? Uh, sure. Thank you very much for the case. So we started with a patient that had left upper quadrant uh, pain. Um, we, uh, and Franco started thinking about the possible organs that could be in this position, like the pleura, the splenic flexion of the colon. Uh, and then we started a patient that had uh, one mom um, indolent. We thought about maybe indolent uh, process, not like as a pancreatitis because that will be acute. We talk about IBD. And then uh, very early when they saw that this uh, elderly patient had uh, weight loss, uh, uh, 
the discussions uh, brought out the possibility of cancer and uh, the, the possibility, for example, if the patient had vomiting after eating, we could think about a pyloric process, process possible, possibly a, 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 a cancer uh, cause. And then uh, we talk about hyperleucocytosis, where the white blood cells are over 100,000, and most of the time are not reactive. Uh, they are mainly primary uh, and hematologic abnormality and it usually most of the time is leukemia. And the leukemia can be acute or chronic, acute when it has a blast and chronic when there is no, not a blast, it's a cell more differentiated and can be sometimes asymptomatic and myeloid versus lymphoid according to the cell type. Uh, and when we have the CT when, and the physical exam, we, we found that the early society may be due to a um, massive splenomegaly. And in this patient that had um, this uh, cell count, we talk about hyperviscosity, where it is when the blood is saturated with cells and it becomes so thick that the blood flow in our body decreases. And uh, Saben told us to pay close attention to the blast because they are bigger and thicker than sticker and they can cause pulmonary dysfunction and clots. It's like the sickle cells, but primary in the chest and neuro-oriented. And uh, in these cases, we also can think about spontaneous tumor lysis. Uh, and then we can, and then uh, we saw in the CT that there was a fluid collection in this, inside the spleen, so that uh, it could, and we started to speak about the causes. Uh, for the moment, we don't know what's the uh, diagnosis of this. We think it may be a probable spleen rupture. So we uh, are thinking maybe a center, as uh, the center of the tumor sometimes becomes necrotic, maybe it's peritonitis, maybe is there activation of infection. We talk about like uh, extramedullary batopoiesis a uh, rupture of a spleen that was contained, maybe myeloid sarcoma. Uh, to next week at the same time, <laughs> at the same hour to see what's, what was the diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Oh, that's really cool, I uh, promise. Um, thanks for joining and uh, everybody have a great week. Um, see y'all later. Thanks Andrea and Kirtan for, for making this happen. Hi, everyone.